Welcome, everyone. You've tuned in to In the Know with the Bullioness, and I'm Dawn Marie the Bullioness, a Silver Level Associate and a top recruiter here at 7K Metals. Please join me in welcoming our special return guest, A.G. Leveraged, an enthusiast of economics, history, and politics. A.G. has a very special ability to break down the complexities of what's happening in today's world in an easy-to-digest way for our listeners and provide positive steps to take action without fear. And I really appreciate this approach as these topics can be quite confusing and overwhelming at face value. On today's show, we're going to be discussing the topic, can one really maximize their retirement in physical silver, or should they stick with the traditional third-party retirement management? With that said, welcome to the show, A.G. Hi, Dawn. How are you? Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday to you. It's a beautiful fall day, and I'm currently in Las Vegas, Nevada, and A.G. is calling in from Los Angeles. And I'm excited to start today's show, so let's get right to it. So, A.G., again, the topic is, can one really maximize their retirement in physical silver? So, if I contribute heavily, either in a third-party management, retirement management, or physical silver, if I contribute heavily on a biweekly basis to my retirement, where's that money going, and is it safe? So in this case, we are told, we meaning, I'm a builder, as I've said before, but let's talk about some of my friends and some of my neighbors who are police officers and firemen and nurses and school teachers and folks who who work for my local city. Um, All of these folks are asked uh, by their their corporation, their industry, their company, um, to invest heavily, as heavily as possible, into their retirement. They're asked to contribute on a biweekly basis when they get paid a big chunk, a big percentage of their check towards their own retirement. And they are told to trust the third-party management that is investing on their behalf that monies. And so everyone does so, of course, in doing so in the hopes that when they reach old age, when we all reach their retirement age, we're going to have a nice chunk of money sitting there that we can depend on on a, on a monthly basis. Um, now, several things are occurring with that. The, um, the retirement funds, the 401ks, the pension plans, uh, the deferred comp, whatever, that, whatever the method of retirement may be, beyond investing in what you and I have talked about numerous times already, which is in a, a big percentage of stocks, and we've talked about how individual companies through low, in, low interest loans, uh, through, through very cheap or very free money, they've gone back to buy back their own stock in order to elevate their stock valuation so that it looks much more attractive than it actually is in real terms. And on top of that, they've gone ahead and got into significant debt. And we talked about examples of that where AT&T, $20 billion in debt, Amazon more than twenty billion in debt. We're talking billions, not millions. Yeah, and so incredible. Some of what, some of what are what what are from the outside, what are perceived to be very strong companies, are once you look at their their accounting, not only are they heavily in the red, but were it not for this cheap money that they could go back and buy their stocks, the valuation wouldn't be where it is. Which means, in turn, that that stock is significantly overvalued than what is stated in in public. Now, that's a chunk of where these retirement funds are investing. Another chunk is bonds. They're investing in in these bonds that we've talked about bonds in the past as well, how those are hurt, whether it's corporate bonds or whether it's bonds that in this case, I don't know if you've noticed, Don, but there is the building of homeless shelters happening everywhere. Have you seen that? Oh, my gosh, yes. So in in most city council, Go ahead. I was just going to say, I just returned from Los Angeles, from West Hollywood. I mean, yeah, that, that area, and it was just amazing. So go right ahead. So what's happening is in city councils across the United States, but mostly for whatever reason on the West Coast, um, and mostly in states that are necessarily under the Ninth Circuit Court, there, there's conversations of 
building shelters, of the need to build shelters. In fact, the state and the county is coming to cities individually and either telling them that they need to build a shelter in order to have access to funds or, or, they're, or legally they're mandated to build not just low-income housing, but necessarily homeless shelters. Now, the question is, where is this money coming from? Well, certainly some of it's coming from the taxpayer, but another big chunk of it is coming through bonds. So some of these retirement bonds are paying for some of these homeless shelters. Now, someone, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm a person working and I'm contributing into my retirement, and usually you want your retirement money to go towards something that, where there's a return on that investment. Right. So you're, secure, so you're secure later on that you can count on some money being there. But if it's being invested in a homeless shelter that, where there's no profit involved, where, where, where you have to actually create more bonds and sell more bonds in order to, A, fix the roof, fix the windows, put in skylights, or potentially uh, nowadays homeless shelters are getting uh, uh, an area exclusively for pets, for dogs and cats, which also requires a veterinarian, which also requires a dog walker, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the money is, is going into that idea, and in order to keep that going, you need to create more bonds that you're forcing the retirement funds to purchase because they have to legally have a percentage in that direction in order to continue either, A, fixing that initial shelter, or B, towards the building of a secondary, if not tertiary, uh, shelter in that same city. And so this is the, the, the cycle that we've created for folks who are working, you know, after 30 years plus, uh, some of these folks that, that serve us, this is our strong middle class in America, they may get a surprise afterwards that says, a letter that says, my apologies, but we're not able to give you the amount of money that we told you we'd be able to because the funds aren't there. And so it's, it's very foreseeable that folks are going to be renegotiated on. Wow. You know, this is, this is just a prime example of overgiving. You know, everything is a balance of giving and receiving. And when you're overgiving, and that means those that are, like you said, have worked their, their lives off in retirement, they're going to be the ones that are actually falling into these homeless shelters themselves because they can't, they're, all their money is going to fund other people, and it's a big overgiving program. Wow. It is an over-promising, under-delivery. And remember, it's going to get to an insolvent point. It's going to get to a point where even if we put aside the, these working professionals that are, that are serving all of us, um, if we put them aside for one second, let's just, stay, let's just take the, the other side of America. There is over 60% of Americans are making well under $50,000 a year. Many of these folks happen to work in retail. So on the retail side of the world, and I don't care if that's a Vons or a Ralph's or, or a Home Depot, we see more digitized um, uh, tellers in the end where you scan your own item before you leave. And so the need for retail is reducing, and that's where a large part of our working American population is. Now, some of the folks, um, I believe it's 50%, 50 pardon me, I don't remember exactly right now, Don, 50% of our population makes under, well under 40,000 40, a year. Now, some of these folks have families and children and so forth. With, with some of these shelters that are going in, the necessary taxes on the general population must also increase, which means that we'll see it in the form of inflation. We'll see it in the form of increase in prices for goods and services. We'll see it in the rise of utilities increases as well as parking tickets, as well as any other form of taxation that we can consider. And so some of these folks that are on the cusp of they're just getting by. They have a job and they're not on any kind of social program. They're not on any kind of social welfare. They're going to be pushed in that direction. And so beyond the working professional that is going to be pushed into a dire position, a dire renegotiation, where they, they may not ever be able to retire, there's a, there's a bigger population that is going to be pushed to definitely have to live in, that, in those very shelters that are being built. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a very unique circumstance that, that we're creating here in America right now. So do you think this is all because of incompetence, um, or do you think there's an agenda behind it? There is most definitely an agenda behind it. 
Right now, if we look at the world around us and we look at India, we look at Russia, we look at Chile, in Chile there's, uh, there's 1.6 million people on the street. The, there's a revolution occurring in so many places across the country, uh, in Saudi Arabia and Lebanon, in um, just countless countries, and they're revolting for, for a variety of reasons, but mostly the underlying theme is overtaxation and and too many social programs for the non-working. And so when you couple that in, in, a, in a, let's not even go too far. If we look at Seattle and we look at San Francisco and we look at Portland and we look at Hawaii, um, we see many revolutions occurring in our very cities in America. Some of these places, they, they're starting to mimic third world countries where they are, where there now exists what are called non-traversable streets and alleys and, and sideways where, where because of, of human matter, because of debris, because of syringes and meth pipes and you name it, um, there are people, families and so forth, that are, that are choosing to avoid certain areas of the city altogether that are getting completely owned by, by usually a very highly addicted uh, population. And wow. those areas are being, they're being um, forfeited altogether. Uh, because they're non-traversable. And so I guess what I'm getting at is, yes, it's being done by design. There is a, uh, a group that is counter-constitution, counter-capitalist, counter, counter, capitalist, counter um, all those things that made America strong, that made us free, that made us a beacon of hope the world over. Um, they're counter those things that make us strong, which is entrepreneurialism, which is let, let's, let's shoulder the risk taker. Let's back the... Uh, the motivated worker. In fact, uh, a lot of our homeless population right now is largely made out of 20 to 30 year olds who actually have a bachelor's. Some of them have a master's, but they're going to universities and becoming indoctrinated against uh, a work ethic. And they would rather um, get onto some sort of, of, of welfare system where it's a way of life. And it, it's really ruining us from, from the core, from inside out. Um, so, yes, I do believe there's agenda occurring, and, and it is the institutionalization of a socialist system in lieu of our current republic. And the agenda ultimately is what? Power? What is the end goal? Goal. The end goal is the, is the same goal as there always is. So if we, if we study history and we look at, in the beginning, socialism starts off as the reason for your pain, the reason you cannot move ahead, is because of the capitalists. It is because of the greedy elites. It is because of, of a group, who the 1%, who keeps it all and gives it to no one else. And so that's the way it's pitched to the general audience. So someone gets elected and institutes a socialist program, a socialist government, where the government comes in and, and, private, and takes, takes hold of all the individual uh, private businesses and uh, likewise does the same with housing so that there is no more private property there is no more small business and these are the things if you recall that are both defended by our constitution and by our bible um, the pursuit of happiness and the pursuit of justice starts with the individual he who's able to buy a home and this is one of the reasons that private property is defended is the person who buys a home tends to also be the one who has a family. He tends to want to have to fix that home and keep it up. He tends to be a part of the community. He tends to be a part of his neighbors. And, and so that's one of the reasons that private ownership is defended to the degree that it's defended. But unfortunately, from socialism, it slowly leads into a form of communism because some people revolt and some people want to continue their individual way of life. Ultimately, it ends in authoritarianism, where there is mass control over the general public. If we look at China right now, for example, in China there are, there are television cameras. There are cameras everywhere, and so they have a grading on, on a social system. Let's say like Facebook, for example, where if a person jaywalks or if a person does something and the camera catches them, now it's got the face recognition AI. So if it catches them, it's able to go into their bank account, and rather than sending them a ticket via the mail, it'll just deduct a percentage of, their, of, of whatever the ticket costs. And wow, or, just out of the blue. Just, wow. 
and or it'll reduce their social rating. Now, their social rating, for example, here on Facebook or, or a variety of, uh, of Instagram and so forth, you're going to get likes on the picture or the posting that you put up. Over there, the likings matter because – if you get a negative, if you get in any way a negative rating on your social uh, persona, there are suddenly you're not eligible to take public transportation. You're not able, able to take first class on your flights. Sometimes you're not able to travel outside the country. Sometimes your children are unable to get into that private school that you want. Sometimes your salary gets reduced. So their social rating is a method of controlling the population so that and by the way, you can't speak against the government either. God forbid you do, because if you do, you get put into a, a uh, indoctrination camp is what they call it. And we can go into that, but, but either you become indoctrinated into agreeing with that, with that method of government, which is a, uh, a, a communist slash totalitarian system, or uh, you don't make it out of that internment camp. You 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 kind of stay in the long term. We don't hear a lot about that in our in our media, and it's a shame. In fact, I'll I'll admit to you, Don, that I have to read and study world news in order to to gain any of this knowledge because our media is so busy distracting us and giving us minutia that's absolutely non non important. And 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 an exhibit exactly. of that is look at this impeachment that's occurring. Everyone knows it's going to get nowhere because there's no meat. There's no reality in this. You can't impeach a president because you don't like him. That's not enough. And yet, we're going to go through the Circus Act, and millions, potentially billions of tax dollars are going to be wasted in this, this, this trial. That, not, not even a trial. It's not going to get to a trial, but into this, this procedure that, that is going to take time, energy, dedication, uh, certainly money. And ultimately, it'll prove to be nothing more than a waste of time and a distraction away from the things that matter most, which are the things that you and I are talking about right now. Exactly. And, you know, the thing is, we don't have millions of dollars to waste right now. There's people that need it and exactly what we're talking about. So we have to be so wise to just open our eyes and see, guys, they're just playing good cop, bad cop. I mean, I believe they're all in bed together. It's just a big distraction. And so... Just pay attention to what's going on, and remember, it's a yo-yo economy. You're on your own. So do as AG does. Pay attention to the world affairs. Amazing. Incredible. So, yeah, this is a big time in history right now with all this going down with the impeachments, and you had mentioned things going on globally. How is that going to affect things globally as well? Well, right right now there's, there's there's a lot of unique things occurring simultaneously. We have, for the first time in a long time, well, it's been happening slowly, but, but now more than ever, you've got countries that are not using the dollar at all, at all. So our we went from being a gold-backed currency in the early 70s. Uh, Richard Nixon detached the gold, which is what backed the dollar. Uh, we went into becoming a... Uh, a petroleum currency. A, um, we were we were the uh, Kissinger went over to the OPEC countries. This was in 1973, I believe, and he asked the, the five countries to sell oil, but but only in the form of the dollar. So it forced all the countries that needed oil to turn in their currency and 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 get and you and basically. Uh, collect and keep American dollars, American treasuries. And that's how they were able to buy oil. And so that need for the dollar is what's been able to keep our inflation low. And it's what's, what's continued to keep us as the world reserve currency. But now that foreign countries are no longer interested in the dollar, having fully realized that it, it, it doesn't have any inherent value beyond what the Americans, beyond what we believe that, that it's worth. We still exchange our goods and services and our time and energy and our sweat equity for with the dollar. It's still currency. We can still pay our utilities and, and pay our, our, our groceries with it, et cetera. But does it have any actual value at the end of the day? No. Uh, proof of that is, and we, again, we've talked about this before, the repo market coupled with they have a new program, and, and I don't remember the name of it, Don, but it's, it's another method of QE. But what's happening is, in excess of $200 billion a day are being printed. 
Well, they're not actually being printed. They're being digitized, and they're being pushed into the banks in order to continue this idea at the pace that it's going. Now, is $200 billion a day enough? The answer is no. At some point, it'll be, it'll be $300 billion. It'll be a half a trillion. Who knows what it's going to get to on a daily basis? But you and I are, are wise enough, and so is our audience, to understand that when a country, when, when the banks of a country, the central banks of a country start to print a fiat paper note in perpetuity, there is only one way to go. You have to continue printing it like mad. You can't go backwards. You can't pull it back. So from this point forward, it's a matter of time. The clock has started. Now, even most recently, Venezuela, what's occurring there, recently you, you'll have politicians saying that that could never happen in America. Well, Zimbabwe or, or Germany or or Venezuela it could all happen here because the recipe that took them all to, to Weimar specifically for Germany is what I'm talking about. What, what took them all there was the, the printing of paper notes at a maddening pace when it has no backing. Um, at some point that all comes to, that all comes to the table and, and things shrink back to their actual value. And, and, we don't really know the value of anything at this point because all we're doing is printing a, a paper note that isn't backed by anything. And, and we're putting on that paper note 2 0, 20, 1 0, 10, 5. We're, we're putting a bunch of numbers on there. It costs them the same to print that paper, and we're <laughs> using it as though it's real, but in, in reality, it's real monopoly money, right? Exactly. So, it's and again, absolutely. this is not fear mongering. This is, this is a. This is a bit of a slap in the face reality check that says, yes, you can watch the game. Yes, you can watch the parade. Yes, you can watch your favorite television show or the game show or whatever you're into. But take the time to be responsible for yourself and stretch. Turn the TV off a little bit. Read some history or get online and look at what's going on around the world and get informed because, you know, there's nothing worse than an uninformed public because, the things that, that come to pass usually come without warning and come to pass overnight. And it's so much better to be prepared 100 days before it happens or 10 years before it happens than a day after. So Yeah, that's all we're saying is preparedness. Pay attention. You know, when we're zoomed into something, we cannot be objective. We can't see the full picture because we're so zoomed in. And in the holistic work that I do, the same thing happens. With dis-ease, we don't want to be so zoomed into one organ that we miss the whole holistic body because the source of that uh, dis-ease in that organ could be coming from a completely different part of the body. And this is why, in my opinion, sometimes Western medicine does not work very well because you need to look at the whole thing and get down to a source instead of putting a Band-Aid on it. So the same applies with the financial. If we zoom out a little bit, if we educate ourselves on what the history has been, what our ancestors have went through, of course those ancestors never wanted to see us have to go through the same issue, but we are being blinded because we are getting so distracted by the circuses around the world, and especially here in the United States, what's going on, that we're not able to stop and say, cool it, like, there's big things happening here, and we need to, like, make a U-turn. Incredible. Have you heard, Don, have you heard of, and all that is, is exactly it, Don. Have you heard of the term bread and circuses? No. So Caesar, once upon a time, would ask all of his uh, city officials, you need to raise the taxes on on, on, your, on your, your city or county or state populations. And some of those leaders would say to him, well, this is back in Rome, we can't do it. We're already overtaxing them. We just, we just can't. So he came up with bread and circuses, which is, which is building um, uh, arenas, coliseums, where he would entertain people and distract people and make sure that they had bread and make sure that they had plenty of alcohol so that they wouldn't... They wouldn't notice what is occurring at their perimeter. 
they wouldn't notice, and therefore they wouldn't complain about their own enslavement. And if you'll notice, we live in a moment in time when no one wants to read or really become educated or go back to school or take a class or, I don't want to do that. I'm not interested. It doesn't entertain me. We're, we're, we're fascinated with being entertained. We just want to sit in front of a television, and it's going to tell us what to think, how to think, who to love, who to hate. And so we become mechanized because our human mind, whatever it sees, our subconscious believes it's living it. And it actually records it as history as opposed to something that's just supposed to entertain us. It doesn't differentiate between something that's entertainment versus something that we're literally chiseling within our subconscious. And so we tend to be reactionary thereafter. We tend to protect and follow the status quo. We tend to follow along with our mainstream media networks as though they're giving us truth, and they're not. They're just pulling us away from anything that's important to notice. And so, so there it is. So true. You know, this is all food for thought, and I know we could go on all day with this, but we do need to wrap up, but we can do our next segment short, soon. So why don't we leave with a wonderful, uplifting tip of the day? <laughs> I'm gonna be as <laughs> How can you day. spin that? <laughs> so let's do this. So recently, Don, um, I, I was listening to a podcast, and, and the word happiness came up. And, and the question was, someone said, should we not strive to be happy? And the responder said, no, we should not. We should, we should pursue joy. However, above all things, let's pursue purpose. Because in pursuit of happiness, um, no matter what, we're going to get ill. We're going we're gonna to lose a loved one. We're going to – something that we, we're working towards – is not going to work. Something's going to shatter. Something's going to get destroyed, and there will be pain. There will be hurt, and we will cry. So, but in those moments of, 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 uh, of challenge, of, of genuine rigor, because of our purpose, because we're, we're pursuing something, because we're in pursuit of becoming better, hopefully on a daily basis, it's that pursuit of purpose which will get us through those very tough times. Happiness falls upon us in very unique moments. Sometimes it's completely unplanned. Sometimes it just falls out of nowhere. It's just, just, just the level of happiness. And we welcome it as often as it comes, but that's not what we should pursue. We have to pursue purpose and, 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 and joy and fulfillment. And, and uh, there's, nothing that, there's nothing better than, there's no way better that I can imagine being fulfilled than getting to know who we are by reading, than getting to to know who we are by writing, than getting to know who we are by learning, than getting to know who we are by engaging socially, um, maybe getting involved in our local city or, 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 or practicing those things that either we, we really suck at as opposed to just practicing the things we're really good at um, and stretching. And so rather than uplifting completely, I'd rather be a little more realistic, which is this. Um, I'm 50 years old, and like I've told my kids, I said, you guys, I'm too old to be dumb. In other words, I, I, I'm too old to be fooled. Um, I've been around this place long enough to not just go along with the program. It behooves me, not just as a father, um, but as a man, as a human being, to, to question and to seek and to be curious, genuinely curious, and, and to look at something and go, hold on, something about that doesn't fit. And then to do the research and get a pencil and get a paper and pencil it out, all of it out, and go, okay, now I know why it doesn't make sense. There's a lot of lies that are around this thing. And then ultimately, you're forced to go back in history to, to find the truth, to find some level of truth. Um, so when we're busy questioning authority, when we finally come to terms to where we are in, in time, because every single civilization that's been before us is, has been to where we are now. And the more we learn about them, the more we understand where we are now, and the more we better understand what happens tomorrow, which also in turn causes us to prepare for that. And so when we do that, again, it all falls back on the most undervalued asset in our planet by far is silver. Not by a small amount, by far. 
Silver is the second component, the second commodity most used only after oil. That's the need of silver in all things that we use. It is absolutely abundantly, ridiculously undervalued, and it's done by design. Because if that <laughs> silver, if, if the human beings, if everyone around us finds out, and I don't care where you're living, the, the reality that that's real money and that the paper that we're using is nothing more than trash. That's all it is. It is nothing more than, than, than paper. If the people were to learn that, and again, you're going to find that through history, you'll, you'll find it through the world around you, you'll fall back to have to get some silver. And we're talking physical silver, not an ETF, not an SLB, not, not your financial planner saying, hey, listen, Don, I got, let's do ten or 20000 in some silver, but you don't have to house it. That's a lot of weight. Why don't I send you a pretty certificate that says that you own thousands of ounces <laughs> and just put that pretty certificate on your wall. That way you're reminded of it daily. You'll smile at it each morning. Giddy up, right? Exactly. You know, they say oh, convenience, point. convenience, yeah. convenience. Yes. And, uh, but we, we want to house it ourselves. So that's how you can maximize physical silver. In fact, we got so into the other stuff, we forgot that. So thank you for bringing it back. Is there anything <laughs> else that we should do about maximizing our retirement through physical silver? Any last yes. final tips? Yes, yes, yes. Stack silver. Sorry I'm long-winded today. Uh, no, stack, that's okay. Stack silver and, and, and stack in, in, in a variety of forms. Stack in a per ounce. Uh, you know, pay a dollar, a dollar and a half, two dollars over spot price. There's a lot of options for that through 7K Metals. Stack in the form of, of uh, rarities and numismatics, something that has been graded, something that has been slabbed, something that has a low mintage, a coin that you can get into that will force you to learn about that mother country or, or maybe learn about that moment in time of that particular coin. Um, and, and, and stack, if you want to vary your, your stacking, stacking in gold, go to platinum, go to palladium. Maybe you want to go through some sterling silver. I, I know some folks who, uh, who buy a variety of sterling, sterling silver jewelry and plateware and dishware and just a variety of items. But those are not just a method of, of stacking and of self-protection and pres- self-preservation. It's also a, a collection, so to speak. And, and in the end, those of us who do that will be better for it tomorrow when – when things get a little tougher as we move forward. Very wise information. So as we wrap up today's segment, if you've enjoyed it, do subscribe to our channel, click the link in the description below the video, and visit our show sponsor's website today at silverpreparedness.com. Learn even more about what's going on with those shrinking dollars in your pocket and how AG and I utilize the 7K Metals membership model to access member direct prices and save big while stashing away that precious silver and gold, precious metals on any budget without any minimums for the best price on the planet. So we invite you to join our thriving team, both with AG and myself. And when you do so, you're going to have access to our inner circle mentoring, our vast areas of expertise, and our extensive team that brings multiple talents to the table. And we're confident you're going to find membership has its benefits. So if you share the vision to get the word out, feel free to share these segments on your social media channels. We need your assistance to broaden the scope of those hearing this important, timely message. So thank you again, AG, for your time and dedication to getting this knowledge out to the masses that have been left in the dark. And until our next segment, everyone, have a day full of wise choices, being in the know, and you have been exclusively invited to join the 1% to 3% that are actually gold and silver stackers on the planet And together, let's create a bright future for ourselves and the generations that come. Good day.